Okay, we will give everyone one more minute to join. We see everyone clicking in. Thank you for joining us tonight. Okay, we will go ahead and get started. It looks like we have most participants in. So thank you so much for joining us. I am Michelle Clark Payne, a member of the Junior League of New Orleans and chair of this year's Abolish Committee. Um, we are excited to have all of you here tonight with us. January is Human Trafficking Awareness Month. To give you a little bit of stats and understand kind of the complexities and um, challenges associated with this issue, in the US in 2019, the Polaris Project, who runs the National Human Trafficking Hotline, received 11,500 reports of human trafficking. And unfortunately, due to notorious underreporting, this is only the tip of the iceberg. So human trafficking is a global problem, um, but it happens in every community and right here in New Orleans. So as we seek to grow awareness and ways that we can all take action, we, we thank you very much for joining us tonight um, and joining us in our third and final part of our um, three-part series around how we can um, fight human trafficking. So just a few quick reminders as we begin tonight, we will be recording tonight's webinar and we will share it with all attendees or anyone who signed up and may not have been able to join. Um, we will definitely open the floor for questions at the end of this discussion, so leaving the last 15 minutes. So as, as we go along, please feel free to add any questions to the chat and we'll make sure to get to them at the end. Um, I will now turn this over to Kristen Van Hookmore, who is going to give us a quick introduction and is, I'm sorry, is the president of Junior League of New Orleans and we're very excited to have her with us tonight and um, she will give us a quick overview. Sure. Thanks, Michelle. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, so I, I first want to thank everyone um, for coming out and listening um, to this really important topic. Uh, this is at one of the initiatives of the Junior League. Um, our focus in the New Orleans area is advancing the well-being of women. Um, and as you'll hear, uh, human trafficking does um, impact women disproportionately uh, to men. Um, so to tell you just a little bit about the Junior League, um, we are a women's service organization. So we're a membership organization and we promote volunteerism um, in improve communities um, through the, and develop the potential of women um, through training through volunteer opportunities. So in the um, last year, we put in 26,000 hours in volunteer service, provided 17 unique volunteer opportunities and 58 training opportunities to our members. Uh, we partner with multiple different businesses and um, almost 50 different nonprofit partners. Um, and so we estimate that we serve um, just over 880,000 members of the greater New Orleans community. So you can see, um, we're a membership of about 2,000 women, um, 500 of which roughly are classified as active members. So these, um, these 500 women are doing a huge lift and really um, pouring their hearts and souls into making the New Orleans community um, a better place. Uh, and so we thank you for being a small part of that this evening. And uh, Michelle, thank you for giving me a little bit of an opportunity um, to speak to all the great things that we do. Great. Well, thank you so much, Kristen, for joining us. Um, so I will go ahead. Um, I wanted to thank Kristen, obviously, for her amazing leadership of Junior League, um, but also the entire Abolish Committee. This tonight could not be possible without them. So thank you, ladies, for doing this and for all the work behind the scenes that went on to make tonight possible. I'd also like to thank the leadership of Women United. So tonight would not have been possible without their generous support. They um, allowed us to have tonight's webinar and many of our Women United members are joining us. So thank you for being here with us. To give you a little bit of an overview about Women United, this is a group of 70,000 women worldwide who have invested 3 million in, local, in the local community here in New Orleans or greater New Orleans area. They focus their efforts on eradicating poverty through policy, philanthropy and programming. For more information, you can visit their website that you see here on the screen or the, the email um, contact Michelle Dunnick with the email address here. Um, so thank you again for your generous support. Now, without further ado, I have the wonderful privilege of introducing tonight's speakers. So we have an amazing um, lineup for you tonight. These are some incredible women to talk to us about how um, what their organizations are doing in the space of human trafficking and how they are working to to combat this trafficking, um, especially we have some, some that are right here from home um, in New Orleans doing some great work locally. So I'm gonna start first with Sherry Lockridge. She is the human trafficking team leader at Covenant House, New Orleans, 
As a former Covenant House resident 28 years ago, uh, Sherry first returned as a volunteer eight years ago, but was quickly hired as a resident advisor in the crisis department. Today, Sherry leads Covenant House's anti-trafficking efforts as the human trafficking team leader survivor advocate, providing support to more than 300 human trafficking victims over the past three years. She works with support from local state and federal law enforcement to identify cases of human trafficking. She is trained in child forensic interviews through the American Professional Society on the Abuse of Children. In 2017, Sherry participated in a year-long undercover investigation called The Track. Recently, she attended the Supporting LGBTQ Youth Certificate Program at Georgetown University and was admitted to our CJJ, or excuse me, admitted to the CJJR Fellows Network in March 2019. She continues to share her knowledge of the human trafficking throughout New Orleans area presenting to health and human service professionals, law enforcement, and community organizations. And we were honored to have Sherry with us last year as we're out Junior League. So Sherry, welcome back and thank you for joining us. Thanks. Our next speaker tonight is Jennifer Ray. Um, she is the Greater New Orleans Trafficking Task Force Coordinator. Jennifer formerly held the anti-human trafficking coordinator position at the Florida Department of Health. She values collaboration and believes that expanding the engagement of multidisciplinary actors will strengthen the response to human trafficking. Jennifer is a Floridian who can claim roots in the Latin community of Tampa, Florida. Jennifer received her master's in applied anthropology from the University of South Florida. Jennifer and her husband, David, called Madisonville, Louisiana home. And we are thrilled to have her now in our community. And third and final um, panelist tonight is Juana Lombard. She's a criminal court magistrate judge. She's a lifelong resident of New Orleans and has been practicing law for over 20 years. She was a former staff attorney for the Orleans Parish Indigent Defendant Program and the Capital Defense Project for Southeast Louisiana. She has also served on the Orleans Indigent Defender Parish Criminal Conflict Panel and the Federal Conflict Panel. From 2010 to 2016, Lombard served as a criminal magistrate commissioner for Orleans Parish. Throughout her legal career, she owned and operated a law firm where she handled criminal, civil, domestic, and juvenile cases, including representing New Orleans public school teachers who were unfairly terminated post-Katrina. She is also a licensed mediator with meditation, arbitration, excuse me, mediation, arbitration, professional systems. During her tenure, Lombard worked with the First Lady Donna Edwards to create a human trafficking task force and awareness program, and was a frequent guest lecturer in front of community and faith-based lenders. So Juana, we're very excited to have you as well tonight. And last but not least, um, Susan, who has been with us, this is her third and final time she will moderate for us, but we're very appreciative to have her back. She's um, our moderator this evening. She is the system administrators for Truckers Against Trafficking. In this role, she's the bookkeeper, HR manager, helper to manage the Freedom Drivers Project and equips companies to educate their staff to combat human trafficking. She has been involved in the anti-trafficking realm for over 10 years. She co-founded a local nonprofit in Denver, helped start a recovery house, and is passionate about eradicating people on the realities of domestic, excuse me, educating people on the realities of domestic sex trafficking. She loves hiking, skiing, cooking, and good conversations. Ladies, again, sorry, that was some tongue twisters, but I really appreciate you being here. Um, and these bios just show you how incredible these women are, and we're so excited to have you. So thank you for joining us, and I will turn this over to Susan to get us started. Great. Thanks, Michelle. I'm so honored to be here again for the third time. I'm going to talk uh, a lot about how we're going to, you all in New Orleans can help eradicate human sex trafficking. So um, without further ado, let's get started. I know that this is all about um, trafficking, human trafficking. So let's start with a definition of human trafficking. Uh, Jennifer, if you could start us off with that definition so we're all on the same page, talk a little bit about the different types of human trafficking as well. Uh, thank you, Susan, I'd love to. And I just also wanna thank again the Junior League for this opportunity. Um, this is a great opportunity for awareness and conversation about this very complex and important issue. So for definition, labor trafficking. Labor trafficking is when an individual feels compelled to work or through the use of force, fraud, and coercion. Sex trafficking is when the individual feels compelled to engage in sex, um, commercial sex through force, fraud, and coercion. Um, also, these federal laws or definitions that I have shared with you goes further and it says that the individual is a minor or under the age of 18 and they're induced into commercial sex 
that it is a crime and you do not have to prove force, fraud, and coercion. Good news is that Louisiana law supports this federal definition and position. And it says in Louisiana law that if a minor under the age of 18 is um, induced into engage in commercial sex, um, they're a victim of a crime and therefore they should be treated like a victim of the crime. And therefore the state of Louisiana has set a complete safe harbor law. And the safe harbor law has two very important things to consider. One, it says that these minors should not be prosecuted under prostitution. And also they should be uh, basically given the opportunity to work with services that are non-punitive and should be put in that direction versus let's say um, taken into jail. So the task force is really critical here because we help implement these laws through our referral network and our collaboration. That's great. I love, I love that the Louisiana law makes it um, easier for, uh, for, for minors to get the help that they need. I love that. Um, Sherry, maybe you could tell us a little bit about who's actually being trafficked in uh, Louisiana and who's at risk and why are more people at risk? Uh, <clears throat> trafficking comes in all ages, um, all races, all ethnicities. So, uh, you know, we, we have a city that um, is based off of hospitality, but the, uh, quite a few people, uh, more than an average person, uh, lives under that poverty line, right? So there's vulnerabilities. Um, we have mental health vulnerabilities. We have drug addiction vulnerabilities. And basically, if you have a vulnerability, a trafficker can and will prey on it and use that to their advantage to get you to do what they need you to do. Yeah, right. It's those vulnerabilities that those traffickers really prey on. Um, so, Juana, here in New Orleans, or they are in New Orleans, I'm not in New Orleans, but where you all are, um, how big of an issue is human trafficking? It's actually... It's huge and it, it affects us in a couple of different ways. One, it draws a criminal element um, to town. So for the past four and a half years, before I, I came back to being a magistrate judge, I have been the commissioner of alcohol and tobacco for the state of Louisiana. And I actually worked with Sherry during that time a lot because trafficking, in addition to what's here that we're trying to get a hold of, we are a big, um, event town, which is a target for traffickers. So what we would find is um, big events, Bayou Classic, Super Bowl, Sugar Bowl, All-Star Game, they come in in busloads, literally busloads from Atlanta in Houston. And so, for example, one, one year, I think we for the whole holiday season, we had to go around to all the clubs and say, you can't have promotional events in your club. And the reason was we realized that these nightclubs, what they were doing was they weren't coming into the strip clubs. They were coming into these regular nightclubs and renting them out for a promotional event. But the promotional event was that they were turning the nightclubs into strip clubs. And then they were trafficking the girls in the back of the clubs. So while we were in, looking in the French Quarter, they were getting smarter and they were moving all around the city. We shut down one on Tulane Avenue. In the same night, we shut down two events. Neither of them were where you would expect them to be. One was so smart, but if we just hadn't been following them already because they were out of Atlanta and on their Facebook page, they literally went and rented a reception hall for the weekend. And they came in two buses and brought 40 girls in from Atlanta. And we know that some of these girls were being trafficked because they had the classic marks, the, all the same branding, all the same tattoos, the things that you see in traffickers. Now they were smart, they came over the state line. They did not have any minors. They weren't smart enough. I mean, they weren't, you know, they didn't bring minors over the state line, but they had a, you know, a bus full of 20 year olds. And we know that's what they were doing. And, you know, we shut them down. We had the police kind of run IDs that night. Um, but what they did is they got the second bus out of there. As soon as they realized we were shutting down the place, the first, second bus was gone. So the issue is it brings not only is it a problem here, and as Sherry said, in all walks of life, we have 
reputable high schools in the, in the state with trafficking issues now where they're getting into the high school girls. And so these girls are not even on the street. They're still living at home and they're still creating little trafficking rings and controlling them within the high schools. And then we have the out of town criminal element coming in for almost every big event. And, you know, Jan's on the task force, she knows they're all looking at, they're coming in from three different, at least three different states and they're coming in in multiple directions. And I think people don't even have a clue of what's going on. I didn't have a clue. I had been in a criminal justice system for years and years and did not have a clue of what was going on and what we were really, really seeing. Um, and these parties that they're throwing is just another way of, of trafficking girls. And then they take all their money and they jump back on the bus and they tilt those girls to the next state um, if they're not caught. Wow, that's that's amazing. Um, well, currently, right, some of those events aren't necessarily happening anymore, but we know that trafficking is still happening. Interesting that you brought up um, the high schools, right? We know that the traffickers themselves are getting younger and younger. Um, so some of the traffickers themselves might be high schoolers, but for sure these, these girls thinking they have an older boyfriend and then get wrapped into that that life or roped into that by forced fraud and coercion. It's just horrible. Um, but COVID-19 hits, a lot of these events aren't happening, but creates a lot more vulnerabilities. Sherry, could you go into a little bit more of how COVID-19 has impacted vulnerabilities and trafficking in New Orleans? Oh, absolutely. You know, like Juana said, it's already behind the scenes. So with COVID, it's really gone kind of underground. We have kids that are spending all their time now doing online schooling um, on the internet. So they're more vulnerable. The, the, the traffickers out there are aware that they're, they're having to be online now and they're reaching out. Um, you know, so, social media has always been access to uh, victims, a way for females to recruit for the trafficker, a way for traffickers to come in and like you said, pretend to be the the boyfriend, the one that's going to take care of them and have them fall in love and then, you know. So COVID has really affected trafficking. We have a hard time. Uh, it's been a struggle, a challenge with outreach, being able to go out there and get in touch and get face-to-face -face with possible victims and try and offer services because they're not in the street, they're online, they're, they're in the hotels, you know, because everything's shut down. So I am, I, I know one, one way we kind of restructured stuff is by reaching out directly to people that are advertising or such, but it, it still leaves a whole a lot of people off for labor trafficking, victims, et cetera. So I cannot wait until this pandemic starts to, to go away with a vaccine so we can get back out there in the street because um, it's affected even how we do presentations and awareness and prevention is a huge key in fighting trafficking. And everything has turned digital online and it's, it's kind of not the same as, as being in front of people and being able to really show and communicate, you know, what's really going on out there in our city. Yeah, uh, you know, when, when I'm educating the trucking industry on what's happening, it's, we take it from, uh, the fact that more vulnerabilities have been created with COVID-19 and that's true, but to hear from your perspective that it's even harder to reach the people, boy, that's tough. Um, Jennifer, I know um, you're on the task force. Tell me what the task force is doing uh, to, to help combat human trafficking. Sure, well, let me tell you a little bit about who the task force is and um, how it's comprised. Um, so we're funded through the Office of Victim of Crimes, Office of Justice Programs. Um, our mission is to combat human trafficking through a seamless collaboration through law enforcement and service providers, and to provide a victim-centered approach, um, which means that we proactively investigate and prosecute crimes of human trafficking. In addition to that, we provide quality services to all victims of trafficking. The task force has a core, which includes law enforcement and service providers. And then we have subrecipient law service, uh, law enforcement, I'm sorry, 
um, agencies and service providers. Then we have MOUs with other law enforcement um, agencies and service providers. And that's our network, which is um, pretty much a referral system. Um, we also have uh, committees within our task force that all members can join, including members of the, of the public, and that is community outreach. Um, we have uh, survivor services, labor trafficking, and um, education, and um, yeah, those are the four. Oh, that's great. So interesting. So members of the public can join the task force. Yes, they can contact us through the website. Oh, that is so good to know. Yes. Um, so Juana, you've also done some incredible work with the first lady I hear heard that in your bio, but I've also, I was talking to Michelle a little bit about that. Can you tell us what you've been doing or what you've done with the first lady and uh, in regards to human trafficking? Yes, it was actually with the first lady and the governor. So <clears throat> my old agency, ATC is a weird kind of hybrid agency in that it's actually a regulatory agency, but it has a law enforcement component. And the law enforcement portion of the agency is actually bigger than the regulatory portion of the agency. So and I must actually say it goes out to my French Quarter um, groups that first made us aware of it. So Jim, Sherry's boss, the lady at Eden House, they like kind of started getting on us almost from day one. Like, look, this is a problem in the French Quarter and you control these bars and strip clubs. Please look at this. Please pay attention to this which is what led us to start getting involved. And then the governor became aware of the, thing, of the whole situation. Louisiana has some of the toughest trafficking laws and the governor um, started get, looking into grants and started pushing all the agencies that could touch it. So um, I started off on the enforcement end, kind of loosely aligned with the task force and working with state police and the NOPD to see what was actually happening in the French Quarter based on tips we were receiving. We ran an investigation and resulted in um, a raid of a, a bunch of strip clubs. We shut down some of the worst ones because they were repeat offenders. Mm. It, it just became a nightmare though. Then, then everybody said we were trying to end sex work and turn the French Quarter into Disneyland. And, and my thing was, I was never trying to end, I was never trying to end dancing. I'm trying to end prostitution and trafficking in licensed establishments where it should not be happening. So that was my take on that then. And then I, went, I formed with the first lady because I said the biggest thing is it's like domestic, I always compare it to domestic violence is that everybody's in the dark, nobody knows what it looks like. And until we get it out there, I didn't know and I had spent my entire life in criminal justice and working in and around the French Quarter then how would the average person know? And you know that, Susan. How would you know just sitting there if you hadn't been exposed somehow, it could be walking right past you? And I always felt that I missed it, and especially when I was on the bench and especially when I was a public defender. And I used to see those girls from Tennessee and Florida, and they're getting picked up on theft charges for rolling johns. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, this little, sweet little girl, I'm going to not give her a bond because I'm going to do her a favor and let her out. And then I'm, I often think how many times that I basically, I did the pimp a favor. I didn't do her a favor. I let her out and go back to him. And he didn't even have to pay to get her out. And then he hauls her back off to Tennessee. And then there's a capius because we can't find her. Um, so I told him, I mean, so we started working on education and awareness. And I mean, from there, we went into all the casinos in Shreveport and Lake Charles and did training to their staff to make them aware of the signs of trafficking. I used by the same team I had that was educating high schools on the dangers of vaping and smoking. We put together a human trafficking component and we started going around the state talking to high schools, to apartment associations, to hotels, to casinos, to, I think we even spoke to the junior league, maybe in Alexandria or one of those places. But it was also scary because we would have people say to us if we contact them and offer them a presentation, oh, we don't have trafficking in our town. Like just, we don't have trafficking anywhere in our whole city. And mm -hmm. so with New Orleans, we have the task force, we have Covenant House, we have Eaton House, we have people that are really involved in the fight, but in the rest of the state of Louisiana, we have major cities saying we don't even have trafficking. And the same city that told us we didn't have trafficking ended up finding three, three the three trafficking victims got rescued. Then they were calling us and state police and going, maybe we do have trafficking. Can y'all come and look at these? 
they had 10 massage parlors in and around this 100 mile area and they're like we don't have traffic you know like you got 10 massage parlors <laughs> you got traffic um and so we started working on educating that became our big thing i think in our first like five months we probably edu did like five you know like taught and trained like 5,000 hotel employees and then i branched it further out into the faith-based communities and they became such active and willing partners and every year in january we would try to do one if not two big symposiums with groups like aka or the links and and the and the ministers and they would have their churches and their parents we started talking at pta's parent groups started asking you know, my people to come in. And so I feel that if we can get the message out at least, then we start to see the signs, then the reports start to come in more. Mm -hmm. um, like in Lake Charles, right after we had done a training about a month later, security noticed these really young girls on the casino floor and it turned out they were three victims out of uh, Texas and they were 19 with fake IDs in a casino. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, whether our training helped that or he would have noticed that on his own, I'll never know. But the point is, that was my goal is to start, yeah. if we can start getting the maids in these hotels to start seeing the signs of, and the, and the, the people on the casino floors, then, then that'll start, ra you know, on that end, we can start raising awareness and we can start, you know, hopefully, hopefully yeah. stopping the problem before it really gets too bad and saving some people. Yeah, talking about it is key, right? What we're doing is educating people, talking about it, discussing it, you know, those junior league people listening, you know, talk about it with everybody you know. Um, like Juana said, they might say it's not happening, but the reality is, is that human trafficking is happening everywhere in every type of city, every type, whether it's a suburb, a city, rural, it's happening everywhere. You know, we just need to be on the lookout for it and to make a call. Um, I always say to call the National Human Trafficking Hotline because that's what I do, right? I work with oh, people nationwide, right? 888-3737-888 is that number or text be free. Um, but there in Louisiana, there, you could always call local law enforcement. Um, maybe there's a, a local number there and you guys can pop that in if there is, but- um, Actually, you know, we encourage them to dial the human the human trafficking hotline okay. as well, or, or state police since they're everywhere in the state mm -hmm. and they can get there quicker. You know, we yeah. used to train people, don't ever approach anybody yourself because you don't know where he or she, you don't know where their, their, their recruiter or pimp is at and you don't know how violent a situation is. Mm -hmm. You'd always train with those two numbers, the trafficking hotline and state police, um, see something, say something hotline. Yeah, we always say to call from the safety of your cab, yes. you know, your, your car in this instance, um, taking notes as to where you are, you know, the if there's a car involved, the make and model of the car, license plate number, date, time, where you are, all those types of things uh, for sure help um, start an investigation. Okay, we got a little off topic there, but it's it's all Sorry. the information uh to put out there um so let's get a little bit to uh the organizations that are actually doing some good work there in louisiana sure you work for covenant house uh, i know there's another house called eden house uh, but tell me a little bit about the work that covenant house does so covenant house is a youth shelter for between the age of 16 and 22 but when it comes to any uh, victim of human trafficking we take any age uh, we don't just provide shelter, we're a structure program. We offer uh, employment assistance, education assistance, housing assistance, um, food stamps, we, uh, Medicaid, we have a clinic on site, we have social workers on site, so they get mental health, they get wellness. Um, we provide an array of, of different therapeutic um, strategies and counseling and case management for them. Um, most people that come in the doors, go through all three of our programs. Um, I myself was a resident of Covenant House and um, lived there, went through crisis, went through rites of passage, which is more independent living, and then out into what they call rapid rehab for now. And so you can walk through the doors and get, you know, up to 18 months of, of security, safety, and just a fresh start kind of on life, a new beginning. So is Covenant House something that um, someone who's being trafficked, they could either call or walk into themselves? Do they need to get referred? How does that work? 
we don't screen at all whatsoever. We have we have no requirements to come in. You just present, and we're intake. You we're, we're never full. We're gonna find room for you, um, and so we're over 24 hours a day. So you don't have to call. You don't have to have ID. You don't have to have birth certificate. We worry about those things later, and we just worry about bringing you in and getting you food or a shower or whatever. Great, I love that. Um, I don't know much about Eden House. I know Eden House is another place there. Um, but uh, what are some other organizations around the New Orleans area that are also doing some good um, work with survivors? Sherry, maybe you could start with others and then. Yeah, it's Eden House is one, they're phenomenal and they're more of a safe haven. Um, the location is not known to the public, um, which is helpful for anybody that um, where their safety is at risk. Family Justice Center, I can't say enough about the New Orleans Family Justice Center because they do wonderful work with human trafficking victims and, and they assist us often with housing and vice versa. Um, when, they, when they're lacking shelter, we'll take them. Uh, you know, our domestic violence shelters around the city, Crescent House and uh, St. Bernard, all of them have opened their doors um, to provide even more shelter for human trafficking victims because we know in the city of New Orleans, there's a lack of uh, housing, stable housing for people. Great. And also, um, the, the First Lady and um, Father Mike, one of the priests and the state uh, and the DCSF also put together a house. It's an undisclosed location. It's called Metanoia Manor. It's primarily for teen victims, and it's a wonderful, wonderful program. They take them in, but they keep them there, put them back in school, but well, it's very, everybody's virtual now, but prior to them being virtual to avoid trying to put them back in a classroom situation, they had the tutors coming in or they were doing virtual learning, but their goal is to get them, they get them all the mental health service treatments they need, and they get them um, back and get a GED before they're ready to leave. And they don't put them out at 18 because DCSF, and that's something that I think when I left the, the first lady and uh, the governor and DCSF were trying to work through is a system where we don't cut these children, these trafficking victims loose until they're ready to be cut loose, even if they age out of the system that they may be in. So the only problem with that particular house is it, um, it, each girl has their own room, they have their own bathroom, they have round, They have two to three counselors that are there around the clock in case they need them in the middle of the night. But they, I think it only houses like 12. Mm -hmm. I mean, it would be so wonderful if we had more of those types of places that could house more people because you know, when you figure some of them are there for two years, by the time they get all their counseling and their GED, that's not really a lot of space, but it is a wonderful program. And then there's another program that I toured. Um, they're also at an undisclosed location and they can house, right now they can house almost 20 at a time. They have a very strict in-house program. And then as they expand, they keep them on the grounds, but move them more into like their own little like house set up so that they're getting back to managing their own kind of household, but still within the confines and safety of um, the compound. And that particular property, a lot of it, a lot of the, the little houses are donated or built by corporations. So like a corporation might donate, sponsor a mm -hmm. specific home. What's, um, the, what's the name of that one again, did you say? That one is, the name is undisclosed. I think it's more like, say, Sherry, they would come through Sherry and then Sherry would fill to them, to them. Okay. <laughs> so you wouldn't just go straight to them. They come from other um, other places, but they're housed in some in a place where they're safe and sound and they're, um, their traffickers can't find them and they're not tempted to go back into the lure of the city, so to speak. Yeah. And I'm sure all of these places need volunteers. Would that yeah. be an accurate assessment? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So there's Having some a house continues. always needs volunteers. We have <laughs> 205 kids on site. We always need volunteers. Yes. That is a lot. Oh. Volunteers are always welcome. And, and you know, agencies like Junior League that come in and do birthday parties and, and, and donate like slippers and pajamas and stuff, that means a lot to them. It really does. Mm -hmm. We really appreciate it. The clients. 
That's great. Uh, any other organizations you guys can think of that's doing good work in New Orleans in the human anti-human trafficking realm? Jennifer, anything to add? Yeah, I'd love to mention the Jewish Family Services. They provide case management and counseling to the immigration population. They have a social worker that uh, speaks fluent Spanish. And as many of you all may be aware, a lot of times when you look at the immigrant population, looking at women, typically they're victims of both labor and sex trafficking. So they yeah. have services through that particular organization to support adults and families. Great, some great, great volunteer opportunities there for everyone out there at these wonderful places. Always good to get involved with at-risk children as well. I say that all the time. Big brothers, big sisters, or whatever organizations you guys have there. Um, Wanna, besides helping at some of these uh, organizations there, what are some what are some ways that we can actually step up to help victims? That's probably a better Sherry question, but okay, um, I, I think <laughs> one of the things that we can do is create people. Um, it, it's, it's so traumatizing that when you do come out of it, from what I gather from talking to survivors and talking to parents of survivors, it is not an easy, you know, one day fix and they need so many different forms of services. First and foremost, obviously, is the mental health and and the stability that that sherry and your covenant houses provide the the getting them through the nightmares in the night type of thing um but helping to find them substantial placement because you have to remember most of these victims did not have the chance to finish high school did not have the chance to go to college and i think um for non-healthcare professionals and non-mental health professionals, the next thing they need is once your covenant house start putting them back on track, they need job opportunities. They need programs that are gonna get them a GED or an apprenticeship and put them in a position where they can care for themselves and start a new life without being tempted. Or with, I mean, if I always say, we. If we fix one aspect and we still don't give them a way to support themselves without needing the type of individual that took advantage of them in the first place, then we're only doing so much for them. We have to, once we get them back to where they're ready to be a functional member of society, we need programs that help these. It's almost like the old Dress for Success program. We need programs that help them learn how to interview for jobs. We need apprenticeships. We need jobs that are willing to to help them you know get a ged or get some training it's kind of like so i work in a criminal justice system and they have all these programs for former felons but it's very similar except for the fact that even if they did commit a felony they were victims at the same time that they were defendants and that's one of the things i want to work on in my court is identifying victims within the court system because Prostitution isn't something we arrest for a lot. There are times when we do, but in Louisiana has just kind of always been one of those things. You don't see a gazillion prostitution cases, but if you pay attention, you see theft cases. You see theft cases when you read that just, you realize it was they rolled a John, and then you start to ask why. Like I have a friend who's a juvenile court judge, and she found the case because the child was arrested. She was 16, and it was 3 o'clock in the morning. And she was charged with stealing his car from him in a gas station. And then she asked the question, why was a 16 year old in a gas station? And why was she inside of the car with a grown man in the first place in order to steal the car when he got out to get gas? Mm -hmm. And that led her to a child that was actually being um, victimized. And so I think that's a, the next, the, I mean, we, uh, we still need tons of volunteers. Sherry and them need tons of volunteers. I think our biggest two challenges is identifying victims and getting them out and then getting them whole as whole as they're ever going to be. Because once we get them out, they go from being victim to survivor. And at that point, if we can get them, you know, not just the, the, the mental health aspect, which they're going to need forever, but get them into a position where they can go get a job where they can start volunteering and giving back, where they have a, their own true purpose in life and their life becomes their future and not their past, mm -hmm. I think is the way that, the best way we can help. Great, 
Great suggestions. Anybody else have suggestions or some goals that they would like to see New Orleans accomplish in uh, relation to anti-human trafficking, Jennifer? Yeah, um, what I'd like to see for the task force moving forward is that we create an opportunity to share more of the type of direct impact that we're having. That is what the work is being done by law enforcement or so social service providers, um, have a better idea from the data that we're collecting, who are the victims and who's vulnerable for trafficking. And then also starting an idea of not only what our success is and who that individual is, but what is it, what does this mean to the community and how can we create a sustainable referral system within our community? And that gets into kind of the cost of the infrastructure. And if we have an idea of what we need to do to build that infrastructure, I think we have a better idea of crisis sustainability and to support all the social services and law enforcement who are also um, receive support through the grant that we have and are doing a lot of great work out there with the amount of arrests that they're making. And the amount of confirmed victims of human trafficking that they've rescued and they've helped. Um, and that's something that I, I really didn't share earlier that I'd like to share that we didn't really talk much about law enforcement, but I would like to share with you some of the numbers from the task force really quick with this opportunity right now. Um, in the last two years, our local law enforcement in Jefferson Parish, including municipalities of Gretna and Kenner, and I'm gonna say this wrong, Pacumines Parish, maybe I said that right. <laughs> oh, you can tell I'm new. Um, it just does not include New Orleans and Orleans Parish, but there were new investigations open for sex trafficking, 214 over the last two years, sex and labor combined, 24 um, investigations were open. And then potential victims interviewed with these open investigations for sex trafficking, 212, and for sex and labor, 27. Confirmed victims of human trafficking rescued. This is all local. Um, sex uh, trafficking 11, ages between 18 and 24 years of age, seven, and 25 through 54 years of age, there was four, and all 11 were females and they were US citizens. Mm. So we're doing a lot of good work. Good, good. Sherry, some thoughts on goals for New Orleans? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with Jennifer. Um, you know, one of the tools that uh, we utilized that uh, Jim and I created when we started this um, trafficking department was a spreadsheet where we were able to start keeping track of were these, were, were these victims coming in from out of state? Were these victims local? What age range were they first trafficked? You know, what age range uh, did the traffic in? And what locations were they regional, national? Who their pimps were? All of, the, all of that data, and like Jennifer said, all that data is very, very important when you're talking about eradicating trafficking within the city. It, 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 it helps you and guides you to know where you need to do your outreach at, where you need to do your prevention at, um, who's the target audience for prevention. So, because that really is the key to ending traffic prevention, to ensure that, that they don't have to become a victim, right? We can prevent people from becoming victims. Yeah. Oh, I could talk all night on this. You guys, the ladies are wonderful. Um, I would also say just uh, as I'm, this was going through my mind as you were talking, Sherry, like, let's make sure that we're, we're looking at, at a potential victim as a potential victim, regardless of what the circumstances might look like, right? Um, maybe it might look like somebody who's on drugs and you're like, no, they're probably just, uh, you know, being a prostitute to get drug money. Well, the reality is they might have been hooked on drugs by a pimp and that's their reward. And so they need help. So let's, let's make sure that, that everybody's treated as a, as a human being and as someone who is in need if we happen to see someone. Um, so see something, say something, call the National Human Trafficking Hotline is the best thing that I can always say to people. Uh, we are out of time for our panel, but we have time for some Q&A. Uh, I think Michelle was gonna hop back on. Hi, this is Melissa Kenyon. I'm gonna lead the Q&A. Um, if you have a question for our panelists, please type it in the chat um, and I'll read it aloud for them to answer. Um, I have a few already. Um, this is for the panel. 
Uh, the first question is, as a business owner, are there opportunities to inform my own employees around issues of human trafficking? Yes, um, I would like to answer just from the task force perspective. Uh, we do have a campaign um, and you can download the materials, which is all work, no pay. Um, you can circulate those materials and use it as an opportunity to talk about the issues of trafficking. We have a lot of other resources if you're interested in data um, and you can also contact the task force. Great. Thank you. Anybody else have an answer? I, I of course have an answer from Truckers Against Trafficking, right? We've got some resources on our site, um, truckersagainsttrafficking.org. You can go to resources um, depending on what type of company you own or are a part of, right? Uh, do you have shipping partners? You could require them to do our training if you're in oil and gas or um, the bus industry, utilize our training. Uh, we do have some resources also overall for just any company. We've got an HR policy you can put into place, uh, an anti-trafficking and persons policy to put into place at any organization. Happy to talk to anyone at any time about that. Thank and the you. state has a human trafficking commission that the governor put together. Um, when I was there, like I said, I had an education team, but when COVID hit, well, when COVID hit, we became so preoccupied with COVID because the agents that were on the team also are the ones that guard like the, the hotels and stuff for overflow when we have to take people that are positive and can't go home, but don't need to be hospitalized, those people have to be in hotels and state parks. But there are still other agencies in the state that are continuing with the training. So if you contact the state's human trafficking commission and it's on the, the us on website, they have a couple of different agencies that are going out and, um, and tra they do basic training on the signs. And if you're a company that uses subcontractors, they talk about what to look for as far as labor trafficking and subcontracting as well. Perfect. Um, one more question here. Um, many of the ways to get involved surround uh, volunteering. And if we're not quite comfortable with that right now because of COVID, are there other ways that we can get involved and make a difference? We can join the task force. Uh, we're having meetings that are um, virtual including the general meeting that's coming up on the 28th and we'll start having committee meetings now in February. So you can join us virtually. That's one way. <laughs> and if you're interested in volunteering and doing some direct care with the actual victims and survivors, we have people that volunteer and they do it all via Zoom or other online resources where they do like meditation, they do painting classes, art classes, all sorts of interest, jewelry making, and they do all that online with the kids. That's great. I'll also mention that um, Junior League has uh, an Amazon wish list drive right now for Eden House and Covenant House, and that's one way you can support them. Um, we're collecting essentials like pajamas, slippers, uh, toiletries, and you can find those Amazon wish list links um, on our website. And I think Michelle is also going to put them in the chat box for you. Um, one final question. This one goes out to Sherry. Um, can you talk a little bit about your LGBTQ training and how trafficking impacts that community? Yeah, sure. So it was really important to me um, because LGBTQ are probably some of the more underserved population when it comes to human trafficking. Um, and we, we forget that we forget that males can be trafficked, transgender population is very vulnerable to trafficking. Um, and so it was important for me to go and, and learn and see what else I could do to prevent and, and, and try to incorporate that, you know, across all boards when I was dealing with clients. And so, um, and I learned a tough lesson and I, I don't want to get emotional, but I, I had a client that um, was LGBTQ and she uh, committed suicide. And so it's really important for me to be able to go in and, um, and, and kind of advocate that, hey, here, here's a community that's extremely vulnerable and, and, and needs assistance like everybody else, you know, and, and try and remove discrimination and barriers that they were facing. Thank you for sharing that. Are there any more questions? Feel free to put them in the chat box.
you know, that's a, I'll just say that, you know, being LGBTQ, whatever else they've added on to that, um, it's a vulnerability, right? And the traffickers prey on those vulnerabilities. Um, a lot of these, these kids are kicked out of their house simply because they're LGBTQ, you know, and that's unfortunate uh, that, that that happens. And so it just creates vulnerability upon vulnerability for those, those uh, people who identify that way. And so they're just, you know, the traffickers know that they can prey on that and they do, it's unfortunate. All right, no more questions? All right, well, we thank everybody. We'll turn it back over to Michelle and Melissa, but I just wanna say thank you so much for having us on. And it's been an honor to moderate all these, these panels for you. So I would say go out, do something, uh, put the National Human Trafficking Hotline number in your phone. Um, take note of everything in New Orleans that these wonderful ladies have suggested um, as ways to volunteer and get involved. Talk to your kids, talk to your neighbors, don't make this a taboo topic. Uh, let's make sure that people know and are aware and just have open conversations about, uh, about it. And if you have any questions whatsoever, I'm always here at Truckers Against Trafficking to, uh, to help. I'm sure these ladies would be willing to answer any questions as well. So it's been a pleasure and an honor. Thank you, Susan. Um, we just wanna take a few minutes to uh, share some resources. Michelle's gonna bring it up um, on the screen. Um, and also thank uh, everyone for attending tonight. And thank you so much to all of our panelists for participating. Um, we hope that next year we can meet in person. Um, and we encourage you to get involved in the community, um, join the task force, volunteer, um, and check out those Amazon wish list um, links that we put in the chat box. Um, Michelle, did you want to add any final notes? All right, I think we're all set. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Have a great evening. <laughs>